Hello everyone, in this video we are going to go through one of the Spring guides. You can find Spring guides at spring.io slash guide and here you will find a lot of short or sometimes even longer tutorials on how to do certain things with Spring Framework and Spring Boot. So today we are going to go through the first guide, building a RESTful web service. This guide is meant for beginners, for developers who are just starting with Spring. So if you don't have a lot of experience with Spring Framework and Spring Boot, and you would like to see step-by-step step how to build a RESTful web service, this video may be for you. Of course, you can follow this guide by yourself, but I know that sometimes it's just easier to see how the code is built up step by step. In addition to following this guide, I will also explain the concepts that pop up, some Spring annotations that you may not be familiar with, so there will be some extra content that will hopefully help you understand better what we are doing here. Okay, in this guide, we are going to build a very simple application that exposes single endpoint slash greeting that will return a JSON content like this. There will be also a step to customize it a bit so that we that it also gets a HTTP request parameter name so that the response payload can be customized. And it should not take more than 15 minutes. The things that you have to have, you have to have an IDE and I would recommend using IntelliJ IDEA. I'm using the Ultimate Edition, but there is nothing really preventing you from using the Community Edition. It will be just as fine and it's free. Then you have to have a Java installed. It can be JDK 1.8. Ideally, it's JDK 11, so the latest stable version. You don't really need to have Gradle or Maven installed because we are going to use a Maven wrapper that I will explain later that just downloads whatever Maven version is required for you. You can also use Spring Toolsuite, which is a plugin for Eclipse. If you prefer Eclipse over IntelliJ IDEA, there is no problem with that. Okay, whenever we start a new Spring application, we usually go to the website that is called Spring Initializer, and it's under start.spring.io. There is a bunch of options here that at first may be a little bit overwhelming. So I will quickly go through each one of them so that you know what we are exactly doing. The first thing is that we have to choose if it's going to be a Maven project or a Gradle project. Maven and Gradle are both build tools. Build tools meaning they will take the code that you wrote, compile it, put it together with the dependencies and put it into the package. In addition to that, they run unit tests, then they can publish packages to central repositories. They can actually even deploy the application to the target server. There are pretty much no limits to what the build tools can do. We are going to use it in a very simple way just to compile, build, and run the application. Maven is considered to be simpler than Gradle, and this is why we are going to choose it. It's also more limited when it comes to functionality and flexibility, but it's perfectly fine for, I would say, most of the projects. Then we can choose the language. Spring supports Java, Kotlin, and Groovy. We are going to use Java as this is the, let's say, the standard way of building Spring applications. If you are interested in similar tutorial, but with Kotlin, then just let me know, please, in the comments. The next section is the Spring Boot version. The one that is selected by default is the latest stable version. All the versions that have a snapshot here, it means that they are still under development, meaning that every day this version can be different. Whenever someone from the Spring team pushes a commit, then this version can be different, which means that probably you don't really want to use it unless you are going to test some cutting edge feature that maybe you would like to give feedback about to the Spring team. Then we have these versions that are marked with M2, M1 or RC1, RC2. These are M2 stands for milestone two, RC would stand for release candidate, which means that this is some step in the development of the Spring Boot version 2.4.0, but the final version of Spring Boot 2.4.0 will look slightly 
different. But unlike snapshot versions, they don't change. M2 is a fixed version. This is how it is right now, and this is how it's going to be. And if you need for some reason to use some third party libraries that are not compatible with the latest stable Spring Boot version 2.3.3 in our case, then you can choose one of the older versions of, of Spring Boot like 2.2.9 or 2.1.16. There is a great chance that when you are watching this video, these versions are already different because Spring Team releases Spring Boot quite frequently. Then we go to the project metadata. Group and artifact are the coordinates of your application. It works in the following way. When you are working, for example, for Microsoft, the group would be .com .microsoft, and here it will be the name of your service. So it could be my service. The name and the description don't matter that much. In case of this demo project, it doesn't really matter what we put here. If you have your own domain, you can put your own domain or you can just fake it and put .com and then your first name, last name, whatever you prefer. So then we have a, let's call the artifact demo, and then uh, we can choose the packaging. For the purpose of this tutorial, we are going to use the jar packaging that is considered a modern way of packaging applications. The war packaging makes sense if you need to deploy your application to a Java EE server or to a servlet container like Tomcat. Nowadays, since a couple of years already, we tend to use jar package way, way more often. So let's keep jar here. And then there is a Java version. So you see that there are three versions over here. Eight is the most commonly used version still in production. 11 is the latest stable version with a long term support from Oracle. And 14 is the latest stable version but it will be replaced by Java 15 in a couple of months. So we will stick to the latest stable version with long-term support, meaning the Java 11. And then we can add some dependencies because by default, Spring Boot does not really bring much of the functionality. Let's go back to the guide. And in the guide, they ask us to add a Spring Web dependency. So let's go back to Spring Initializer add a dependency to Spring Web. And it says that it's Spring Web is meant to build web, including RESTful applications with Spring MVC. If you scroll a little bit down, you will see that there is also Spring Reactive Web, which serves the same purpose, but uses different programming model. And it is slightly more difficult, more complex. So if you are just starting out, I would totally recommend to use Spring Web. And then we just hit generate and it will ask us to download a zip archive that I will download just to my downloads folder. So let's now open it, unzip it, and then I'm ready to open it in IntelliJ or the IDE of your choice. Okay, so I will open IntelliJ IDEA and click on open or import, go to downloads, and then open demo directory, and then I can open pom.xml as this is a descriptor for our project. And then I just click open as a project. It may take a couple of seconds until the project is fully imported in IntelliJ. It also depends if you have ever used Spring Boot before and if you have Maven dependency cached already or not. In my case, it was quite smooth. So this is what the generated project contains. It has a source directory with a single class demo application and with a public static void method, which means that we can run this application as a normal Java class. So I can basically click right click here and hit run. In the console, we will see that the spring application has started and it also started Tomcat on port 8080. Tomcat is a, our web server. So this is what listens for HTTP requests. It listens on port 8080 and it's embedded inside our application. So Tomcat is a part of the application that we are going to build. What about Maven? There is a main file that describes the Maven project called pom.xml. And here you will find all the properties that we put previously in the form, like the group ID and the artifact ID. It also has which Java version is used. 
and a list of dependencies. So we've selected Spring Boot Starter Web in the Spring Initializer form. It also adds a dependency to testing frameworks using Spring Boot Starter Test. I imagine you may be wondering, what are these starters? Starter is a Maven artifact that brings other artifacts, which means that instead of adding multiple dependencies to make it possible to write a web application with Spring, we can include just the starter web and it fetches all the dependencies for us. We don't exactly have to even care about which exactly dependencies are there. Often we do want to know what's inside. How to find it out? You can go here to Maven section in IntelliJ and expand it and you will see the list of dependencies. And then if you look, there are two starters that we can also still expand. And then it means that the starter web brings Spring Boot Starter, Spring Boot Starter JSON, Spring Boot Starter Tomcat, but also Spring Web and Spring Web MVC. And the same way for Spring Boot Starter Tests. It brings actually much more stuff. It brings JUnit, AssertJ, Hamcrest, Mokito. So all the libraries that you potentially will need when you want to test Spring applications. Okay, now let's go back to our guide. We created application with Spring Initializer. We have the following pom.xml. We didn't choose Gradle, so we can skip it. And then we come to the next point where it's about creating a resource representation class. The idea of this application is to have this slash greeting endpoint that will return a following content. It means that we have to have a Java class that will be later on serialized to this JSON. So we have to create a class with a field ID, which is a type number, it can be integer or a long, and a content, which is a string. So let's go back to the code and create a greeting class like it's set over here. So I right click on my package name and do new Java class and create a greeting. We need two fields, it will be private, long ID, private string content. And then I will create a constructor and getters for these fields. Getters are necessary. Without getters, these fields will not end up, at least not by default, in the JSON payload when you hit the endpoint. Okay, let's go back to the guide again. And now we need to create a resource controller. Controller is a type of class that it's meant to execute incoming HTTP requests. So let's call it got greeting controller. And then we need to annotate it with a rest controller. Rest controller means that we are not building a web application with HTML pages, but instead whatever we return from the controller, we want it to be a JSON or XML payload. This resource controller will have just a single method, greeting that will map to slash greeting and will tell, we'll return an instance of a greeting. We also want it to handle a request parameter name so that we can customize the response. Okay, so let's go back to the code and create a get mapping on the greeting path. This method will return greeting we can call the method the same. And there will be one request parameter, which will be called name. And we would like to here return a new instance of greeting. Greeting has two fields, ID and the content. In the guide, they made it in a way that the content is just an auto incrementing number. So they use this atomic long over here. And the template for the greeting message is specified over here. So it's a template hello, and then whatever we pass in the request parameter. So let's just copy these two lines. I need to import this class. So I will hit option enter on Mac. And then I will do counter increment and get, which will just first increment the number and then return it to the greeting. And then we will do string format 
and we format the template with the name passed as the request parameter. Let's run this application now again. So I go to demo application. I can either right click and click run demo application or I can just click on this triangle over here. Stop and rerun because the application was already running in the background. And now we are able to execute HTTP requests. You can either use Postman, Insomnia or whatever HTTP client that you prefer, but you can also just use curl. So I will open now my terminal and call curl HTTP localhost 8080 slash greeting. And let's see what happens. We will see an error, a bad request. Why did it happen? Let's go back to the controller. We've added this request param over here. It means that this method expects that in the URL, there will be a request parameter, meaning whatever is under, whatever is after the question mark. So in this case, it has to be greeting question mark name equal John. Escaping of these equal signs and question marks is added automatically by my terminal. I don't think it has to be there in case you are not using ZSH. So now let's call it again. And then we will see the response that we expect. Okay, what if we would like to support slash greeting, then we can either change that this request parameter is not required. Or we can just set what is the default value for it in case it's missing. So we can hey, like hello, and by default, it will be world. So let's now restart the application, I can click over here, rerun demo application. It's up, I will go back to the terminal, call it again. And then we see that there is a hello world. So later on in the guide, they explain what is a get mapping annotation. In Spring, there are a couple of ways how we can map the URL to the method that is going to execute a certain action. The most convenient way is to use this get mapping annotations. It means that it will expect the HTTP get method and this path. There is also another way we could just annotate it with request mapping. And by default, it will accept all the different HTTP methods. So we could call not just HTTP get, but also HTTP post, delete, and so on. This request mapping can be customized. We can put what is the method. And we say that this is just for the get. And then we need to specify what's the path that it's greeting. So this is this gives us exactly the same result as just using simple get mapping annotations. In most cases, the get mapping is what you need. But in case you have to support multiple different HTTP method types, perhaps you would have to look into request mapping annotation. And how can Spring serialize it to JSON? Building JSON responses is not actually a part of Spring framework itself. Spring uses a library called Jackson. If we look again at the dependencies, you will find that when we import Spring Boot Starter Web, it imports Spring Boot Starter JSON that imports a library called Jackson. And Jackson is the way to serialize Java objects into JSON payloads. It has a lot of flexibility, so we can customize it with a couple of different annotations. In this example, the default Jackson behavior is exactly what we want. Let's go back for a second to this demo application class, because you might be wondering what is the Spring Boot application. That's the annotation that marks the entry point to every Spring Boot application. And if you command click or control click instead, in case you're using Windows or Linux inside, you will see that this annotation is annotated with a couple of other annotations. It has a Spring Boot configuration, it has enable auto configurations and component scan. Spring Boot configuration means that this is the main configuration class of a Spring Boot application. It also means that we can here define a custom Spring Beans if we would need to, let's say if maybe we would have to create a greeting service class, we could define it over here. 
the component scan means that every class that is annotated with one of the Spring Boot stereotype annotations, like component, controller, service, or REST controller, it will be automatically picked up by Spring and added to the context. So in our case, for the greeting controller, it was just enough to annotate it with REST controller to make it work. The thing to remember is that it does the component scanning only in the package and in the sub packages of the package where this class annotated with component scan is. So this means that if we would have here a different package, let's say we would create a package com foo bar and move this greeting controller over here and restart the application, this controller will actually not be picked up. So this class will never be seen in runtime by Spring. If I now hit the curl, we will see that there is 404, like, like this class would never exist. Okay, the last step is to build an executable jar. So actually that we can run the application not only from the ID, but we can build a file that we can later on deploy somewhere, either if it's in the cloud or our on-premise servers or just even our local host. So let's go back to an IDE and execute a Maven goal package. When we execute the package goal, Maven does everything that is needed in order to package an application. So it will compile the project, it will run the tests, and then build a package depending on how the project is configured. In case of Spring Boot, there is a Spring Boot Maven plugin that does all the heavy lifting for us, so we don't really need to customize it in any way. If you look into the target, you will find that there is a demo 000 snapshot jar. The name comes from the coordinates that we declared in the pom.xml. So that's a name of the artifact, dash the version, and then there is a jar. And if we would like to run it, we can go to the terminal, go to target directory, and then just do java dash jar demo 001 snapshot. And it will start a Spring Boot application that we can call again with curl. And this will be it. Congratulations. We have just together developed a RESTful web service in Spring. Why is it RESTful? Because it's not an actual REST application. We will see what is an actual real REST application in the later video. But I think now you have a pretty good starting point to dig deeper, to play with Spring, to create your own classes and see how they behave. I hope you learned something. I hope this tutorial was helpful for you. In case you have any questions, just please write in a comment and I will try to answer as soon as I can. Thank you. Like this video, subscribe, share it with your friends who are learning Spring as well. And I hope to see you in the next video.